Today, we're wrapping up our five-part sermon series, The Soul Food of a Christian Servant. So as I say every week, uh, of course, I use the Bible, but I'm also using a book by Warren and David Worsby as the uh, backdrop or resource, if you will, for this sermon series. The book is titled 10 Power Principles for Christian Service. And in their book, they present what they call 10 unchanged principles that lead to good success in ministry. Well, uh, since I love a recap, here's a recap. So far, we've talked about how the foundation of ministry is character. The nature of ministry is service. The motive of ministry is love. The measure of ministry is sacrifice. The authority of ministry is submission. The purpose of ministry is the glory of God. The tools of ministry, the word of God and prayer, and the privilege of ministry is growth. Today, it's all about the power and model of ministry, the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to serve. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come before your people to proclaim your word. Now, Lord, I'm asking that everything I say and do be inspired and instructed, motivated by the Holy Spirit so that your truth and nothing but your truth is spoken, received, and believed. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're using as the backdrop for today's message, Isaiah, the 61st chapter, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll move over to John, chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. First, Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And now John 13. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the power of ministry is the Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozer was considered one of the uh, more prominent Christian thinkers of the 20th century. He was a pastor, he was a, a teacher, a preacher, an author. He had a lot to say about a lot of things. Here's what he had to say about the Holy Spirit. He said, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of this world, most of what the church is doing would go right on and nobody would know the difference. Hmm. What I believe uh, Brother Toes is saying uh, or suggesting is that the true spiritual and transformational power produced by the Holy Spirit is often underutilized in churches. The truth of God's word, let me be clear, never changes. The principles of uh, how we uh, witness that truth, I don't think never changes. But the methods certainly do. Well, many churches are living beneath their Holy Spirit power potential because instead of acknowledging the power within us to witness the truth of God's word in new ways, to help people grow in their faith in new ways, to love others in new ways, we continue to try to use outdated methods and then we get stuck in the old ways because sometimes it's easier to operate in the space of routine instead of revelation. The moment we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, guess what? The Holy Spirit was infused in us. It was poured into us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Church, we've been regenerated, we've been renewed, we've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And FYI, in the New Testament, when it talks about being filled with something, that means to be controlled by that something. And so we need to be very careful not to be filled with the wrong things. Because if you're full of hypocrisy, guess what? Your life is controlled by trying to make people think you're something you are not. You're play acting. 
If you're filled with anger, guess what's controlling you? Anger. If you're filled with envy, guess what's controlling you? Envy. If you're filled with greed, guess what's controlling you? Greed. The world is full of people that are full of some stuff other than the Holy Spirit. But because we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we ought to think, we ought to desire the things that God wants us to think and desire, to be inspired and instructed by the Holy Spirit in our day-to-day -day lives. Hear this. And just because we're controlled by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that we're out of control. Don't get that twisted. That's because the fruit of the Spirit includes self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law, the Bible says. So listen, if you drink too much wine during the upcoming holidays, it may cause you to lose control and you might do some foolish things. But with the Holy Spirit, we gain even more control to choose actions that don't lead to foolish behavior, that lead to wise behavior. We're supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not fooled by the spirits. So let's connect now this uh, text in Isaiah to today's message. So Isaiah 61 begins with a prophetic announcement about the coming Messiah and the restoration and healing the Messiah is going to bring to Israel. Uh, good news will be preached to the poor. Uh, the brokenhearted will be healed. Liberty will be proclaimed to the captives. Prisoners will be set free. It'll be like the year of Jubilee every day when the Messiah shows up. Seven centuries after Isaiah's prophetic words, Jesus himself in Luke 4 quotes those words from Isaiah and announces that he is the Messiah and that he is the fulfillment of those words. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Tag, I'm it. He confirms who he is. He confirms where the power of his ministry is going to come from, the Holy Spirit. He says, I've been anointed. I've been sent by God to do the heavy lifting that the world needs, to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the sick, to proclaim liberty and end oppression. So in their book, the uh, Worsby's uh, post, uh, oppose uh, what I think is, is a very great question. Here's the question. If the sinless Son of God needed the Spirit's power for his ministry, where does that leave us, his weak and sinful followers? Great question. Where does it leave us? Ordinary people, church family, can do extraordinary things by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. The secret sauce of Jesus' ministry was the Holy Spirit. The secret sauce for our ministry today is the Holy Spirit. Without that sauce, we can do nothing. Without Christ, the Bible says, we can do nothing. And when you look back uh, at the early church, uh, you really don't have to look hard to see that that early church did not have many of the things that we today uh, consider essential, the essentials of running a ministry today. Uh, back then, there were no big budgets, uh, no seminary-trained uh, pastors. There were uh, no uh, politicians uh, sitting among your congregation or just a phone call away. The secret to the early church's good success and the secret to our success now, I believe uh, we can find identified in Acts 2, the fourth verse that says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. All. And last I checked, all means all. They were all filled. Being filled, uh, being uh, controlled by the Holy Spirit 
is not some uh, exclusive upgrade for VIP Christians only. It's not. Everybody was filled, Lottie, Dottie, and D, Bubba, and Mama Nim, all filled. They were together in one place, and they were using their tools for ministry, the word of God and prayer. And the book of, uh, of Acts goes on to, to say in chapter 4, 33, And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. The Holy Spirit responds to hearts that are thirsty, to hands and to feet that are ready to lead. But hear this, the Holy Spirit is not going to pour into a dirty vessel. I'll say it again, the Holy Spirit is not going to pour into a dirty vessel. So um, one of my pet peeves is an untidy kitchen. Oh, I don't like an untidy I tell you, if I'm going to the kitchen before I can even cook a thing, if the kitchen is not tidy, trust me, I'm going to clean it before I cook anything. And I'm going to clean as I go. That's Earth White style. I, I think better uh, when the kitchen is clean. It helps bring out the joy of the culinary experience for me. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit <laughs> doesn't like a dirty kitchen. If your character pan needs scrubbing, if your uh, service serving tray has rust stains, God wants you to clean it up before God can use it in the way in which God wants to use it. If the foundation of ministry is character, lack of character will stifle your ministry. The Holy Spirit is not interested in helping you if the only person you're interested in serving is yourself. In fact, the words we say this, they say to ask for God's power while ignoring God's holy standards is only to tempt the Lord and lie to the Spirit. To seek the power of the Spirit without the fruit of the Spirit is to put asunder what God has put together. If we've been filled with the Holy Spirit, and I know we have, then the question becomes, how do we achieve the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Is it a two-step process? Is it a five or ten-step process? Well, in actuality, it's not a step process at all. It's a trust process. Trust the sovereignty of God. You can't predict what the Holy Spirit is going to do or the way the Holy Spirit is going to do it. Just do what the Holy Spirit says to do. Trust God. Don't waste your time trying to figure it out. The Holy Spirit may have you do something one way today and it may change tomorrow. But what doesn't change is God. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Every move of the Holy Spirit is not some spectacular spectacular. Sometimes the Holy Spirit moves in subtle ways, but always with powerful results. The power, the power, the power of ministry is the Holy Spirit. And the model of ministry is Jesus. So if you've ever toured a model home, you will quickly learn that model homes come with upgraded features and they come with a cost. They, they, in fact, sometimes will add a hefty price to the base price of the home. Oh, the countertops, uh, the Marvel countertops look very nice in that model home, but they're not standard. The, the, the shelves in the walk-in closets are great looking, but they're not standard. The, the oversized island in the kitchen, it, it makes for a great workspace, but it's not standard. The hardwood floors in that family room are not standard. Now, they're going to tell you that the upgrades will add value to the home, and that may be true, but they come with a cost. And so by the time you leave the model that you were hoping to reproduce on your lot, you may have been priced right out of your dream home because you want what's in the model. So instead of being excited about the home you wanted to buy, now all you can think about is the disappointment you're going to feel every time you step on the carpet in your family room instead of hardwood floors. How disappointed you're going to be when you walk into your shelfless walk-in closet. 
Now, it may be unreasonable to do it, but this is just my opinion. I think whatever you display in that model home ought to be standard in every home. Otherwise, it's not a model home. It's a sales gimmick. And that's just me. Church, Jesus Christ is not a sales gimmick for ministry. Jesus is the model of ministry, the model for everyone. What we find in Christ are humility, meekness, mercifulness, sacrifice, compassion, kindness, encouragement, positivity, patience, all standard features in Jesus Christ. What Christ models, we have the authority to reproduce. There's no need to look for another model. Jesus did not try to manipulate people. He chose to relate to people and to connect the gospel to their particular need. He talked to fishermen Andrew and Peter about becoming fishers of men. They could connect to that. He talked to the woman getting water at the well about receiving living water. She could connect to that. Nicodemus was able to connect the physical birth of a child to spiritual new birth after the conversation he had with Jesus. When Jesus told his disciples in John 13 to do what he did, he was not just talking about washing each other's feet. Don't just talk about serving, serve. Jesus was the ultimate servant leader. And the words we say this, they say servanthood begins with an attitude, an attitude to serve. What Jesus did day to day reflected the attitude of not what's mine is mine, but what's mine is yours. Here, take it. Philippians 2 and 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. So remember those bracelets that um, we used to wear that posed the question, what would Jesus do? In some situations, the answer to that question it is, it is not obvious or easy. But it's a great question for assessing direction. Because it should point us in the direction that keeps or represents the character of Christ. Look, Jesus didn't convince every person that he encountered that he was the truth, the way, and the life. He didn't. The rich young ruler rejected the model of ministry that Jesus presented. Nine of the ten lepers that uh, Jesus had, had healed uh, they refused to come back and say thank you to the model of ministry that Jesus represented. But Jesus didn't stop modeling. He did not stop modeling, and neither should we. Love as God loves us. Bless as we've been blessed. And teach what Jesus taught. So that lives are transformed, the power of forgiveness is realized, and the abundant life in Jesus Christ is experienced. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. And so let's do some things that reflect the power within us and model how to use it individually and collectively as a church. The foundation of ministry is character. The nature of ministry is service. The motive of ministry is love. The measure of ministry is sacrifice. The authority of ministry is submission. The purpose of ministry is the glory of God. The tools of ministry, the word of God and prayer. The privilege of ministry, growth. The power of ministry is the Holy Spirit. The model of ministry is Jesus Christ. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can we pray for you? Our prayer team would love to pray for you and your family. They're standing by. Just send us an email to aumc at ashburyumc.org and we will pray for you. We'll stand in the gap for you. We'll trust the Lord with you. Thank you for your generosity. If you'd like to share a gift with us, you're welcome to do so. Uh, there are multiple ways to give. They're right there on your screen. You can go to our website and click the Give button. You can text to give. Better yet, you can join us in our sanctuary on Sundays at 11 o'clock uh, and uh, praise the Lord with us, celebrate life together, and you can share a gift at the end of the service. 
Lord, I thank you for uh, the word that has gone forward. I thank you, Lord, that those that heard it, receive it and believe it in Jesus name. We thank you for the gifts and for the givers. Amen. And I thank you for joining us today. As I said earlier, you're welcome to join us at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning here at 2201 South Derry Ashford Road. Join us for our worship service and bring your entire family. Our kids Zone volunteers are standing by. They teach the word of God on a level that your children will understand. We have a nursery. And we have Teen Quest for your teens, 13 to 18 years of age. A great opportunity for them to go and grow and glow and learn how to navigate the crazy world we're living in by using the full armor of God. Well, I send you forth each and every uh, Sunday, each and every week with uh, three questions. I pose the questions, you know the answers. Who's the head of this church? Jesus Christ is the head of this church. Who is the church? We, we are the church. And what are we as a church called to do? We're called to serve. God bless you all. I love you. I'll see you next time.